The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. People are very much in favor of democracy, but they don't seem to like the politicians involved in it all that much. Is it time to leave them behind and do government by the people differently? We'll kick the tires on some new ideas around that tonight. First up, political scientist Alex Marland. He explains why party politics may be responsible for whipping up some of the distaste around current democratic practice. It's Tuesday, October 20th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Well, despite what people tend to say about politicians, you'd actually be hard pressed to find one that went through the ordeal of seeking a nomination, campaigning door to door, and possibly getting elected with an eye to doing nothing and having no influence. To a person, they're usually motivated by a desire to serve their communities. Alex Marland is a professor of political science at Memorial University. His new book examines one of the ways that hopeful ambition can hit a brick wall. It's called Whipped, Party Discipline in Canada and Alex Marlin joins us now from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Alex, good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm okay. Thank you for having me. Glad to hear it. Let's set up our conversation with my reading an excerpt from your book right off the top here. Here we go. Political parties are essential for keeping large numbers of politicians organized. However, the systematic integration of politicians is so successful that some believe Canada has the most rigid party discipline of any liberal democracy and that party government has supplanted parliamentary government. The tight binds of partisanship among Canadian politicians are at odds with political parties' loosening grip on the electorate. The near iron hand of party discipline that keeps parliamentarians in the fold is arguably the greatest frustration that Canadians have with their system of government. Let's get into this, Alex. How do you see that frustration manifesting itself more, moreover? I'm, I mean, I'm glad that you have that quote because there's so many things that are in it. I think one of the things to think about is the, the more that Canadians learn about political parties, I think the more frustrated they would get. Um, anybody who becomes a candidate with a political party instantly starts realizing that they are not a free agent, that they are joining a political club, they are part of a team, they are supposed to follow the rules of that team, and then you become an MP or an MPP and the rules get even tighter for you and you start realizing that wow you know i'm i'm not here to to make a difference i'm here to represent my party i mean this is not what i signed up for and so generally i, I would say that this is the the challenge for a lot of people they become reduced to voting machines they become party robots they become trained seals and for the average canadian it's not a good look it doesn't make us think that we have a a vibrant democracy when parties are so powerful. And how did you conclude that we seem to have the strictest system out of all of the Westminster style parliaments? Um, well, it's not so much that, that I've concluded that, it's that political scientists have said that a number of times. So the research that I've done has looked exclusively at Canada, um, but drawing upon what other researchers have done uh, points out that you know Canada's is some of the strictest. Some work that has been done that does look at Canada says that, you know, uh, there there are, were politicians in the last parliament who voted 100% of the time with their party. 100%. There, there wasn't a single time they voted against the party. I mean, uh, how is this possible? And a lot of them would say it's because they inherently support the party. They support the leader. But a lot of us would say, well, it just doesn't make sense. Surely there's got to be times where you disagree. So what is it about the system that compels you to always vote with your party? Well, I found one of the most interesting numbers in your book uh, related to a guy who uh, represents a riding in the capital city here in Ontario. His name's Nate Erskine Smith. I think he represents Beaches East York. And I've always regarded him as a bit of a maverick, you know, who would be prepared to buck his party when he felt his conscience required him to do so. And yet you tell us he voted with his party 96.1% of the time, which, uh, you know, was very eye-opening to me. Which of the federal parties actually is the most disciplinarian when it comes to voting? Uh, oddly, from what I've seen, it, it ends up being the NDP. And uh, in a way, that's that's odd because we think of the NDP as, you know, supporting democracy. I mean, it's the, the new Democratic Party. Um, 
But part of the reason for that is because of the ideological coherence in the NDP that, you know, if you're going to be a member with that party, you support organized labor, you support all sorts of principles in their constitution. The real, the real test is really whether you are in government or whether you're in opposition. When you're in opposition, you're not obliged to vote the party line in, with the same amount of pressure as when you're in government. And for me, this is probably the, the main thing that I found that is so troubling. If you are a part of the governing party and you're part of the government side of the house and you're a backbencher, meaning you're not part of cabinet, there's still an expectation that you vote with the government all the time. And not only voting with the government, but you're promoting government messages. So you become a, a messenger from the government when really you're meant to be holding the government to account. It's a, it's a real frustration for how the system is designed. Well, it's interesting. That transformation uh, has really been quite profound because once upon a time, the way you just described it is the way it was supposed to be. Backbenchers were part of the system to keep the government and the cabinet in check. In fact, I think the expression you used is they're now brand ambassadors. What are the implications of that change? Right. So, um, you know, part of what I'm, I'm suggesting is uh, politicians have moved from being foremost lawmakers and then they became constituency caseworkers. And now, as I see it, they've become brand ambassadors. The idea being that they are promoting messages of the party, of the leader and on the government side of the government. The, the biggest problem is that that stifles free discussion and debate in the public domain. So you end up having politicians who are given messages and are constantly promoting these messages and can't really get into any real substantive conversation other than supporting the party line publicly, because if they do, it's controversial. The media will pick up immediately. Opponents will draw on it, will say, oh my gosh, this person is disagreeing with their leader. This is a big news story. So there's all these pressures on politicians to stay with the party whenever they're speaking publicly, which of course, doesn't sound very uh, very much uh, healthy for a democracy. Well, let me, for argument's sake, make, make the other, put the other side of the argument out there, which is in caucus, which are supposed to be private conversations, members of uh, parliament or members of their provincial legislatures are encouraged to be uh, combative as heck. They're allowed to have good, vibrant, energetic debates about things, but that once the party comes to a decision, whatever that means, they're expected to sing from the same hymn book and they're expected to go out there and be loyal team members. What's wrong with that? So a lot of politicians say nothing is wrong with that. And in fact, you have to do that because if not, you'll get eaten alive. Um, but here is a fundamental thing that I'm not sure that everybody is fully aware of is something that has fundamentally changed other than obviously all the changes with the media is that staff now have a permanent presence in caucus meetings. That did not used to be the case. That is something that has transformed in the last 10, 15 years. It seems to be intensifying. Certainly there's a large presence of, of staff in uh, Justin Trudeau's caucus meetings and, and other premiers. And the, the staff will say, well, they have to do it. Information moves so quickly nowadays that they need to be there and hear things in real time. Here's the problem. Staff have an incredible amount of power over the career of a politician. And even if the staff says, I don't really, the bottom line is the politician thinks that they do. So what happens is in the caucus meeting, they don't feel free to speak up. A lot of the, the free dialogue you talk about happens in the regional caucus meetings, in the smaller meetings where staff may not be present. I wonder if as well there's a generational thing here, because a lot of these staff tend to be in their 20s and 30s, and a lot of elected politicians tend to be in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I'm guessing that people who actually went out, took the, took the courage to put their name on a ballot, got themselves elected, do not want to be taking orders from a bunch of young whippersnappers. Is that part of it? Uh, that has been going on for a long time. There's an expression you might have heard, you know, boys in short pants, which is not just exclusive to, to boys uh, by any means. The, there is an incredible amount of frustration and a lot of annoyance, frankly, when somebody who has a lot of experience and expertise is told by essentially a young whippersnapper, look, you're not doing this right or you'd better do the following. The, the challenge I think that staff are not always familiar with is how much power they convey just by representing the office of the premier or representing the office of the prime minister or any leader's office, that it's it's a, a perception that is held by the people they're speaking with that they themselves may not always be aware of. Now, let's do a real life example here. And of course, there are tons to pick from, but one of the ones you raise in the book, which um, it just said everything about what, uh, what you're railing against here, 
was a British Columbia member of parliament by the name of David Wilkes. And we're going back almost a decade now. And he's, I gather, in a diner or a coffee shop or something like that, talking to some constituents about some issues related to the upcoming budget. He was a, a Stephen Harper member of parliament, conservative member of parliament. And, and he just was sort of explaining to people why he had to vote the way he had to vote. And it turned into a huge controversy and really affected his career. Fill in the blanks, if you would, on that story. Okay, so uh, this this David Wilkes is a backbench member of uh, the Conservative government with Stephen Harper. He holds a meeting with a number of constituents, and they're sitting around saying, why don't you just vote against the budget? This is wrong. We don't want you to support this. So he explains how the system works. He says, look, as a backbencher, if I vote against the budget, I'm no longer going to be part of the ca of uh, caucus. That's simply the way it works. It's the confidence convention. For anything to uh, you know to really affect change on the budget, there would have to be maybe a dozen backbenchers who would all stand up and say, "We're not going to take this." So there, there's really no point. If I vote against the budget, um, the next day I will no longer be part of the party, and my my political career will probably be over. And so they're all trying to understand this. And, and he's, you know, very democratic. He says, sure, I don't mind if you record this. That's fine. And so somebody records it, puts it up on YouTube. Well, you can guess what happens after that. <laughs> all sorts of people. There's all this controversy. It's in the media. It's talked about all over the place. And everybody's saying, this is terrible. How can he be saying this? And more than that, people start demonstrating. They start mobilizing and saying, we need to get 12 Tories all together to vote against the budget. Anyway, he gets called into the whip's office. He's told to apologize, and he's taken off some committees. Um, he, he ends up not being very satisfied about his political career, and uh, now he's he's a mayor, and I think that he's, he's much happier as a mayor than he was when he was in Ottawa. But if I remember from your book, uh, Stephen Harper actually had a conversation with him about this too, didn't he? Yeah, and this was one of the interesting things is a lot of us think that the leader's fingers are all over this, especially somebody like who is powerful as, as Stephen Harper. But frankly, a lot of it gets delegated. Um, I've been told that it's not a good idea to have the, the prime minister or others bothered by these sorts of details. It, it's stressful. And so what happens is it gets delegated. So whether it's to staff or to the whip or somebody else, uh, they're the ones who are dealing with all of these internal challenges that are going on about getting people to toe the party line. So a lot of the discipline is actually, it's more of a, a collegial discipline than it is necessarily coming from the leader uh, directly. I, I asked this next question, cognizant of the fact that I'm sitting here in the William G. Davis studio, named after the former Ontario Premier here at TVO. And, and the question is this. You know, I wonder if, as, as much as backbenchers don't like the phenomenon you've described, they do put up with it to a great extent, uh, unlike many in the United States who uh, seem to relish the, the hurly-burly aspects of politics down there. And I wonder if it's because, as Bill Davis once said when asked, why do you run such a bland, boring government? His answer was, bland works. And I wonder if our Canadian temperament, which presumably extends to these politicians, partly accounts for the reason why there are so few revolutionaries on the back benches. I, I mean, there's some truth to what you're saying. I think political parties want that. They certainly want um, party soldiers who are, who are not causing trouble. Um, but, you know, out here in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, there's a, been a number of colorful personalities over the years. And... People like John Crosby and Brian Tobin have really found a way to develop their own personalities. I I would encourage you to think about the current cabinet the, at, at the federal or provincial level. Think about backbenchers. It's really hard to think of mavericks and strong personalities the way that they used to exist in the past. So I would say that what's happening is with social media and the ability to monitor what people are doing, we're really seeing political parties exert their control and saying, look, you, you better not go out of line publicly. You better stay with the message because otherwise there's going to be trouble. Well, let's state the obvious here as well, which is you don't have to go to the back benches to find these examples. Uh, we have one in the last few years uh, in the nation's capital where uh, Jane Philpott and Jody Wilson-Raybould, two members of the cabinet of Justin Trudeau, uh, were unhappy with the way that he handled the SNC-Lavalin affair and as a result um, made the ultimately made their concerns known outside of caucus, and both of them were drummed out of the caucus. And, of course, uh, Jane Philpott's out of politics now, and Jody Wilson-Raybould came back as a, was fortunate enough to get uh, re-elected as an independent. When you look at that situation, what conclusion do you come to? 
Well, thanks for raising that because I, I was fortunate enough to interview both of them for this book, and there is a section about the SNC Lavalin crisis or, or uh, affair, I guess. Um, there's a lot of layers to it. I think we need to think about the fact that the SNC Lavalin dispute was foremost a policy dispute within the government, but then it transformed into a party issue once uh, those two women were no longer part of cabinet. Why were they not allowed to stay within the Liberal Party? Why is it that they ended up getting the boots? And part of it was because they were still speaking and communicating with the media. The idea is essentially, once you are part of the caucus and once you are a backbencher, you are meant to stay quiet, stay out of it. If they had not spoken to the media whatsoever, they would have done a disservice to Canadian democracy, but they would have done a service to the Liberal Party of Canada. And so that's a that's a different way of looking at how our democracy works. Let's pull another excerpt out of the book here. Sheldon, I am at the bottom of page three. If you could bring up this quote, just four to five percent of the Canadian electorate prioritizes candidate factors in elections, a percentage even lower in urban areas among less informed voters and outside of Quebec. Voter assessments of local candidates matter to the outcome of elections in only 10 to 14 percent of seats. This means that candidates make a difference in close races, but otherwise have no practical bearing on who wins or who loses. If political parties did not exist, or even if party labels did not appear on the ballot, then voters would be more attuned to their local representatives. This is, I mean, this is absolutely true, and it's got to be incredibly depressing for those who put their names on ballots and think those names matter at all. Um, I mean, how depressed... How depressed should we all be about the fact that, that the people who, who take the trouble to put their name on ballots and knock on 30,000 doors, and it accounts for next to nothing at, at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge, isn't it? I mean, I think in, you, you always have to look at the good and the bad. And the good is that with, you know, the, the synthesizing of messaging, we have a lot of clarity about what political parties stand for. So when somebody is going to vote and they're trying to think about leaders, they're trying to think about parties and their positions, at least there's clarity. And that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the challenge, of course, is that your average representative is not going to make much of a difference to the party about whether or not they're able to win or lose the seat. And a number of people I've interviewed tell me this sort of thing. that They are told all the time, look, you are probably going to make the difference between 10% of, of winning or losing your, your chances are are 90 percent of the vote is coming from the leader it's coming from the party so you better do what we tell you but on the flip side what the parties are doing is saying we need you to knock on doors because we need you to generate data about constituents we need you to put these in these pads that are going to get uploaded to the cloud so that we can in turn contact people for money um, and ask them to donate make sure that they turn out to vote ask them to show up for an event um, and if you do anything wrong, you're going to be cut off from that database, which is even more challenging. Hmm. Let's ask the big if question here, which is, and I'll make the comparison to um, Westminster in the United Kingdom, where they do allow a lot more free votes and where backbenchers are allowed to act more independently than they are in Canada. If we allowed that much independence on the backbench or among cabinet ministers in this country, what do you think the implications would be? Well, it's always higher to know for sure. So all we can really do is look at the past. And the reality is that any time that you have um, a, well, the, a, a fundamental principle of being part of cabinet is whatever one minister says has to rep represent the government as a whole. So that whole system would kind of collapse, that you'd have this problem where you'd have ministers expressing different points of view and everybody would be saying, well, what is the government's position? So they all have to stay together as a united front. The bigger question is what would happen if political parties allowed more flexibility? Could they have more free votes? Could they have more opportunities for people to speak their minds? And I think some parties would say, yeah, we do allow that on some private members bills and things that are low stakes. Um, occasionally there are free votes on things that they can't get everybody together on. But the bottom line is, I would say that what would be healthy for Canadian democracy is if we saw a few more independents elected every now and then, um, some more independents, we couldn't have too many of them because the system wouldn't work, but some more independents who are free of the shackles of any political party would allow people to speak up and say things that the other parties may not be willing to say. Let me get you to comment on an example that uh, I'm sure very few people know about in Canada, but it works for them and it's quite fascinating. In Nunavut, they have no parties. They have a non-partisan legislative assembly and somehow I guess stuff gets done. Could that system be transported to 
provincial legislative assemblies, for example, and still work as it apparently does there? Yeah, great point. Uh, so it's known as consensus government. It exists in the Northwest Territories as well. And what happens is people run for election. There's no political party. After the election, all of the members gather together and conduct a vote to identify who should be the premier. And in some ways, that's great because you remove all this power of political parties. I would say it's in many ways anti-democratic to have a bunch of elected officials decide who the premier ought to be instead of the general public having a, a clear say on who that leader ought to be. Um, but that aside, could it work in the provinces? Um, from the research, that, the limited research I've done in this area, I'm of the opinion that it could potentially work in small places. So it could work in Prince Edward Island. It could work here, potentially in Newfoundland and Labrador. I, it could not work in Ontario. There's just way too many people. Um, it's you, It only seems to work when there's a very small number of legislators, because once there's a larger number, we can see this in the Senate, people start breaking up into groups. Hmm. Let me... Um down to our last few minutes here, and I do want to ask you about the fact that, that people spoke to you very candidly, it seems, for your book, but of course, they're out. When people are in, <laughs> you know, th this kind of honesty about the rot of the system does not tend to come to the fore. What do we do about that? Well, there were a number of people who are in the system who would speak with me. The difference is they were more likely to say, um, don't say who I am. Right. <laughs> so they wanted to be anonymous because they, there's career implications. Um, what can we do about it? I, I don't know that we can do a lot about it. it. It's a real challenge, especially with the media. When the media starts reporting on unnamed sources, um, you know, there's there's a challenge there because they can use the media to um, conduct, um, you know, trial balloons and uh, maybe say something negative about somebody. And we we don't have that level of accountability. I would say that for me, one thing that um, one person who really got me to rethink about things is uh, Stockwell Day. Uh, when I interviewed him, uh, he was uh, he, originally for another book. He said he only does interviews if he is on the record. And I thought about that and I thought, why is our default to always protect people's identities? Why shouldn't the default be in academia to say, look, I'd like to be able to name you. Is that OK with you? Hmm. And actually, it turns out in this book, a lot of people wanted to be named. They just don't want quotes attributed to them. <laughs> well, let's finish up on this then. If somebody watching us right now is thinking of running for office someday, but now is uh, questioning the wisdom of that decision because they don't want to be a trained seal on the back bench. They'd actually like to achieve or accomplish something. What's your advice? So my advice would be to take a look at some of the research that the Samara Center for Democracy has done. They have a lot of research about explaining what life is like as a parliamentarian. As well, uh, this particular book that I've written, the final chapter is a list of how to be a list of items, how to be a strong parliamentarian. So I, I compiled all the different points of view and uh, tips and advice that politicians provided to me. And it's a summary and it says, look, this is what you can do. And, and I think there's a lot more that can be accomplished than people realize. The biggest challenge that I, I suspect that a lot of people don't realize is you have to put in a lot of work to build a consensus. You have to build a consensus in the caucus. You, if, if there's a government, the cabinet eventually has to agree. You have to make sure interest groups and the general public have support. You have to really work hard to mobilize and so the idea that you can just walk into a room and say, I think we should do this policy is, is not going to work. You have to work hard to affect change. Hmm. Well, I must confess, when I, when I picked up WIPT um, at almost 400 pages about party discipline, I wasn't sure that this was going to be a page turner. But I got to say, it's, you've got great stories in here and you've made a real great contribution to our better understanding the nature of Canadian and, and provincial politics in the country today. That's Alex Marlin, the author of Whipped, Party Discipline in Canada. He's a professor of political science at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Alex, thanks so much. Thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you. There are 338 elected members of the Canadian Parliament and 124 MPPs at Queen's Park. But how often do we actually hear from any but a small group, the party leaders, maybe a few top ministers, in the daily cut and thrust of our democratic politics? It's easy to be cynical about that, but what happens if we ask, do we really need all those politicians? And as a democracy, whatever might replace them. 
With us to inquire fearlessly into all of that, we welcome in the nation's capital, there's Gary Keller. He's vice president at Strategy Corp and once chief of staff to former foreign minister John Baird. In Hamilton, Ontario, Clifton van der Linden, assistant professor of political science at McMaster University. And also in the ambitious city, there's Vass Bedner, public policy consultant and editor in chief of Regs to Riches a newsletter about startups and public policy in Canada. And it's great to have you three with us here on TVO tonight. Let me just start by throwing a few numbers your way, and then I'll get you three to comment on those. According to Pew Research, that's PEW Research, a very reputable research outfit in the States, these numbers admittedly a couple of years ago, Canadians were asked what they thought about this statement. Elected mm -hmm. officials care about what ordinary people think. Only 24% of people surveyed agreed with that statement. 59% did not. Almost 60% of people surveyed pre-COVID thought our democratic system does not represent them well. 60%. Vast start us off. Are people right to think that way? I think they're right and they're wrong at the same time because the primary technology that we use to find out what people think or how they feel is polling. And it's very impersonal, right? So it doesn't surprise me that because we rely so much on polling, people then feel that there's an inauthentic connection with their elected officials. The flip side of this is that there are so many technologies out there and technological options where if we were to invest more in our deliberative infrastructure, we could do a better job actually talking to people and help politicians who are fundamentally kind of platforms of the pulse of the people do a better job doing what they're supposed to do. Let me just jump in. Deliberative infrastructure, what does that mean? So we have examples from around the world and some that we've been incubating in Canada and I think some that we'll talk to on the show in terms of how we can tap into the pulse more, um, co-author, crowdsource, legislative documents, um, kind of go back to people and also improve the explainability of our final decisions. So that's actually something I think politics and policy has so much in common with technology. Um, when it comes to the movement of explainability and AI, there's a hunger, I think, to understand, well, we made a decision, but why? Not just downloading what the decision was, but why did we choose that? We know other options were considered. Sharing the rationale can help build trust in our parliament, I think. Interesting. Okay, we'll come back to that later. Gary, those numbers off the top, how do you react when you hear those? Yeah, well, while I'm not surprised, it's, it is disappointing to hear those numbers. Uh, and, you know, with, with political uh, actions that take place, um, you know, with scandals that happen or the scandal du jour, uh, whether it's at the federal level or the provincial level or even at the municipal level, uh, you know, citizens uh, don't really differentiate uh, between the two or three levels of government. They see a scandal and they hear about it in the newspaper and that in itself, you know, deteriorates public confidence, trust in the system. And, you know, I think it behooves all elected officials um, to have that in the back of their mind when they are acting or they think they're acting uh, in the public good. Um, the challenge is uh, with some of the technologies that, that Vass talked about, um, you know, having worked on both sides of the aisle, both in government and in opposition in senior house leadership roles, the government house leader's office or WHIP's office or the leader's office, uh, our Westminster style of government is not well set up to handle some of these mm. technologies. Uh, it's in, in mm. a lot of ways it's trying to pound a uh, square peg into a round hole. And so when new ideas come forward, and I'm thinking of when Preston Manning, this guy who from Western Canada came out with this funny little voice and this ragtag band of MPs and started talking things about like referenda and direct democracy and citizens assemblies, the political elites in Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal laughed at him. I even think about the time mm. when he tried to demonstrate that he was one member of parliament out of many. He wasn't just the leader, but he was one out of many. And he sat in the second row of the House of Commons as leader. And he was laughed at and mocked at by the political elite in Ottawa. So um, while those numbers are not surprising, they are disappointing. And that's why we we have to have strong rules, strong laws in place so that members of parliament who and, and elected officials always have those concepts in the back of their mind when they're making decisions in the public good. Clifton, I'll remind everybody, elected officials care about what ordinary people think. 24% of Canadians endorse that view. How disappointing is that number for you? 
disappointing but not surprising. If you look at the results of the Canadian election study, which goes back uh, decades, uh, you'll see that in the 1980s, early 1980s in particular, there was a sharp drop or a sharp increase, I should say, in cynicism among Canadians. And this reflects a broader global trend, um, which may be the result of a variety of factors. Uh, but the notion that people generally feel that politicians are largely set out to advance their own agendas, as opposed to the agendas of, of the people and the, the public interest, is something that is a, is a finding that's uh, been reproduced over decades. Mm. Now, just before you folks got here, we did an interview earlier in the program with Alex Marland who's a poli-sci prof at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador. And he's got this new book out called Whipped, uh, which really does not paint a very pretty picture of, um, you know, the amount of free speech that politicians in this country have and, and what their party whips oblige them to do. Let's just play a short snippet of that and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Sheldon, if you would, the clip. The more that Canadians learn about political parties, I think the more frustrated they would get. Um, anybody who becomes a candidate with a political party instantly starts realizing that they are not a free agent, that they are joining a political club, they are part of a team, they are supposed to follow the rules of that team, and then you become an MP or an MPP, and the rules get even tighter for you, and you start realizing that, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, to make a difference. I'm here to represent my party. I mean, this is not what I signed up for. And so generally, I, I would say that this is the, the challenge for a lot of people. They become reduced to voting machines. They become party robots. They become trained SEALs. And for the average Canadian, it's not a good look. It doesn't make us think that we have a, a vibrant democracy when parties are so powerful. Yeah, Vassie went on to say they're, they're basically brand ambassadors. And I wonder mm -hmm. what the... What does the spectacle of having supposedly intelligent people mouthing the exact same talking points day in and day out, everywhere they go, regardless of their interactions with the public, what does that do in terms of undermining people's faith in rational democracy? I think it does a lot to undermine people's faith in democracy in that it feels like a bit of a pantomime. So. You know, on the one hand, it's comforting that our parliamentary institution has been so resilient and consistent over time. But on the other hand, the vector of representation that we have, geography, is outdated. It fails people. People don't live and work in the same riding anymore, except now in the pandemic when you work from home, right? Mm -hmm. And the population is more educated than ever before. They're more engaged. We have more tools. There's an expectation of more, more touch points, more opportunities for input beyond the election cycle. So it makes less sense to elect one person and kind of absolve yourself of any kind of constant input into the decision-making process. On the side of, you know, being whipped or that kind of message control, I think it's skewed a little bit too much, but it doesn't surprise me and it doesn't actually bother me that much. I think it's a little bit of a flawed fantasy to think that an elected official, someone gets elected, and then they're running around with like a Word document or Google Doc, like writing legislation uh, to engage in robust policymaking. That is a team sport. We have think tanks, we have the civil service, we have academics. Um, and I think we need to move away from that because that idea in and of itself is actually, to my mind, undemocratic. The idea that I elect one person and then they're going to go kind of, you know, write, write a policy and that's it. I don't like it. Although, Gary, you know, on this issue of talking points, uh, and your former boss, John Baird, was one of the best at this. You know, the old expression was, you say it over and over and over and over. And when you are absolutely sick to death of saying it, only at that moment has it penetrated the consciousness of the electorate in general. Because, of course, they got mm -hmm. real lives and they're not focused on all this stuff. Uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the other facts of politics as well, is it not? And what do we do about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, that's absolutely right. In order for a message to get out, it has to be repeated and repeated and repeated over again. And I, you know, I'm a strong believer in the premise that politics is a team sport. Uh, mm. You know, 
don't tend to elect independents in this country. The rules are stacked against independents. Look, if parliamentarians, mm -hmm. if, if, if MPs wanted to uh, change the rules, they could amend the Canada Elections Act tomorrow and provide uh, incentives for independents to run and get elected. Uh, it is extremely rare for independents to get elected in our system of government. Uh, most mm -hmm. independents who do get elected have been either kicked out or left another party and got elected themselves as an independent. But even the simple rules rules like let's say you're an independent you're independent minded and you really feel strongly about getting elected you can't yeah. raise money between election campaigns you can only raise money in a, in a year that there's an election and it's only a maximum of sixteen hundred dollars per person and let's say you you do really well you get elected and you have a surplus you know political parties get to get that money back that surplus money back if you're an independent Elections Canada gets that money. So the rules are stacked in such a way that it, it makes it almost impossible for independents to get elected. And I, and I actually don't mind that system because I do believe that politics mm. are a team sport. And if we had 338 independent MPs uh, and we got rid of political parties and banned them, they would gather together in coalitions of loose fish anyway. Well, I like what Jane's position mm. on X is, and I like what Steve's position on Y is. And boy, I sure... Sure, like sitting with Christine on committee, maybe we should, you know, get together and divvy up the work so there's not so much work for us. So I think especially with the Westminster style of government, politics is a team sport. And I think that's just the reality of, of the way things are. It's a team sport. But Cliff, Clifton, I wonder whether, you know, on the one hand, we have an incredibly rigid discipline system right now where members of parliament essentially by 96, 97, 98 percent margins vote with their party on every vote. Uh, that was one of the things that came out of Alex Marlin's book. Uh, on the other hand, you have a scenario that Gary just described, which you know may, simply may not work in a Westminster-style system. You study the, the political behavior of politicians. What's your sense of how seriously Canadians are taking uh, the behavior mm -hmm. of our politicians when they hear this message track wrote, disciplined, you know, over and over and over? Well, I think there's a, a discount that's applied to um, to political speech by most uh, Canadians. Um, I think they recognize that in a party system like ours, uh, before you can be elected by the public, you have to be elected by your party or nominated by your party. Um, and to that end, your you know your first loyalty it ostensibly may be to your party because, to Gary's point, without that mechanism in Canadian politics, you really don't have much of a shot of uh, mm -hmm. being elected by the public. So I think there's a broad recognition of that fact. Uh, I do think, though, that in, in Canada, at least, um, the the public confidence in our government is more than is more dynamic than just the confidence in elected politicians they're actually in canada we have high levels of institutional trust in our government institutions and our public service uh for example which to some extent may act as a counterbalance and there also needs to be some recognition that mm. um that the practice of politics is not merely uh how people vote in the house on a particular bill uh, it's also the backroom discussions that happen among politicians, uh, the interest they bring yeah. to the table in caucus. There are a lot of discussions that happen behind closed doors where I think politicians mm -hmm. are advocating uh, for the interests of their constituents, um, uh, but those conversa conversations are in camera. Uh, so as a result, these interests may be brought to the table, but as in all party politics, once a decision is made, it's a united front. Well, as Monty Python might have said, and now for something completely different, as we consider alternatives to our current first-past-the-post system and the way we do politics, politics excuse me, in this country. I want to play a clip here from a guy named Brett Henning, who runs and started something called the Sortition Foundation. And if you want to talk about a different way of doing politics, listen to what this guy has to say. Sheldon, clip, if you would. Its technical name is Sortition, but its common name is Random Selection. And the idea is actually very simple. We randomly select people and put them in Parliament. <laughs> Let's think about that for a few more minutes, shall we? Imagine we chose you and you and you and you and you and you down there and a bunch of other random people and we put you in our Parliaments for the next couple of years. 
Of course, we could stratify the selection to make sure that it matched the socio-economic and demographic profile of the country and was a truly representative sample of people. 50% of them would be women. Many of them would be young, some would be old, a few would be rich, but most of them would be ordinary people like you and me. This would be a microcosm of society. And this microcosm would simulate how we would all think if we had the time, the information, and a good process to come to the moral crux of political decisions. Vas sortition a long way from where we are today, which is a very professionalized mm -hmm. political class. What do you think of the idea? So I wonder if people will be willing to or able to give up that chunk of time in their lives, right, two, three, four years. But I do love the concept as it applies to something like civic lotteries, which we have been incubating with Mass LBP here in Canada and kind of randomly selecting people just like a jury, a citizen's jury, and having them dig deeply into big policy issues and come up with recommendations that elected officials can have. Um, were I to be randomly selected to become a you know, member of parliament for a couple of years, I think it would totally freak me out. It's not for everyone, <laughs> but we should be talking about this. I, 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 there's something there. There's something there about the randomness and representativeness that I think we should be digging into. See, you say it freaks you out, but I would be delighted to be governed by somebody as wise and intelligent as you. So why would it freak <laughs> you out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there's there is an ambition for the for politicians in in being that professional class. So I think people would welcome the work of reflecting their best thinking in a in a group in a team setting. But I think the difference in being a politician and an individual is that it's your brand, right? It's your persona. And that's different from randomly asking people to think hard about a really difficult issue, which is what we should do more of to have a more trustworthy, credible parliamentary system. Hmm. Gary, as a good conservative, you no doubt remember uh, William F. Buckley once saying, I'd rather be governed by the first 200 names in the Boston telephone book than by the uh, you know, <laughs> 200 smartest professors at Harvard University. Um, what do you think about this notion of sortition? Well, look, I, I think there's some issues with it because uh, for for every vast in the world, that would be great to be plucked out of uh, at random to be uh, to be part of a parliament. There's obviously the flip side to that argument as well. I, I do agree with one uh, point in that clip, and when the when the the person talking talked about a microcosm of society, I actually think mm -hmm. in a lot of ways parliament is a microcosm of society. Yes, is it representative as a whole of, of, of society? No, but there are pockets and there are uh, different classes of people uh, who sit in parliament. And, and we have to remember as well that uh, the only, um, you have to get cleared as, as a candidate by your party, but as a first time MP, you have a 36 day job interview and that's it, uh, and an election campaign. Uh, you are, you know, there are a lot of regular people who do decide uh, that they want to put their name forward and 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 become part of the political system. And I don't think that's a bad thing. So I do think, in some ways, it's not completely representative of Canadian society. But in some ways, Gary, there Gary, are Gary, it's it's it. I mean, it fails the first test. There's there's 25 percent of the members of Parliament are women. I mean, that's that's dramatically underrepresenting women in decision making capacities in the Parliament of Canada. I mean, you know, on gender balance alone, but, it flunks, and we can go on from there. No, but, but there are groups of, like, whether it's professional class or education or background or experience, there are those groups in Parliament that do exist, and I have seen them up close, and they do represent their constituents fairly well. On the general issue, there has been talk of using citizens' assemblies for, for change and for uh, decision-making. And, uh, you know, on certain issues, I don't think, you know, pitching those ideas around is a bad thing. But, uh, again, in a Westminster-style system, I think we'd have to look at a broader change to think. Clifton, can I get you on this issue of a, a sort of so-called citizens' assembly? Because I remember we tried this in Ontario in 2007. We literally put, I think, 120-some-odd people uh, together if you like, in a room for several months and got them to study alternative methods of electing members of the Ontario legislature. And at the end of the day, the process itself was widely prized as being extremely effective. 
And, you know, the average citizen really felt like they had a stake in their democracy. At the end of the day, their recommendations were rejected overwhelmingly by the electorate. But the process by which they did their work, is that something you can imagine on a wider basis? I think it's an exemplary model of how citizens' assemblies can be applied to inform policymaking uh, more broadly uh, across a wide range of topics. Whether or not um, whether or not citizens' assemblies or some sort of sortition method should supplant um, elected representatives within a professional class mm. of, of politicians is another question. I think if we can create more opportunities for, for citizens to come together to deliberate substantively and meaningfully on important public policy topics and then have those uh, the, the findings of those discussions and the conclusions that are reached uh, reflected in the legislation that politicians then go and try to sell to the public. Uh, I, I, I think that's a win for representative democracy. Well, let's, uh, if you like that idea, we had something else for you here to, to chew on as well. We um, would like you to consider democracy without politicians at all. And we're going to show you another clip. This one is from a Chilean physicist and author named Cesar Hidalgo, whom Clifford, I think you know. Mm -hmm. And yes, okay, so let him explain what he's got in mind and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Imagine for a second a world in which instead of having a representative that represents you and millions of other peoples, you can have a representative that represents only you with your nuanced political views, that weird combination of libertarian and liberal and maybe a little bit conservative on some issues and maybe very progressive on others. Politicians nowadays are packages and they're full of compromises. But you might have someone that can represent only you if you are willing to give up the idea that that representative is a human. If that representative is a software agent, we could have a Senate that has as many senators as we have citizens. And those senators are going to be able to read every bill and they're going to be able to vote on each one of them. Okay, put some flesh on that bone. How would this work? So Caesar's referring to a, a sub-branch, a sub-field of artificial intelligence called, that's called machine learning. And the idea of machine learning is to have a series of algorithms that draw on existing observations, a data set of existing observations, which can be anything from uh, the types of purchases you make to the types of media you consume to the way you vote. And it can use that data from your past behavior uh, in order to model future behavior, to predict uh, how you might make purchases in the future, how you might vote in the future. Um, and so Cesar is saying that we can take this idea and we can use it to solve one of the biggest problems of representative democracy, which is cognitive bandwidth, which is the time that we actually have to contemplate um, uh, the numerous issues and ideas and, and bills and, and uh, legislation that, that, that politicians have to uh, uh, contemplate on a daily basis. Um, we're, we all lead extremely busy lives. Steve, you already made reference earlier in the segment to the fact that people have other things to worry about. They have jobs and kids, and, and these things are very consuming. Uh, so the idea that they could sit down and read every bill that's uh, put forward in, uh, for, for a vote and somehow directly vote on it, I think is a hugely problematic one. We just don't have the time. We don't have the capacity to do that. So the promise of artificial intelligence, and I, I'm sure we'll scrutinize this, but the promise of artificial intelligence that Caesar's is putting forward is that it can allow... Uh, if, if you provide it with sufficient data to train it, you can have these machine learning models actually predict future behavior. So they could theoretically, or machine learning could theoretically understand you well enough that it would know your values and interests in such a way as it could reflect those value and values and interests in an automated way in, a, in mm -hmm. the legislative process. Um, this is a very... Uh, uh, polemical uh, claim in, in many ways, but I think at, at the very least, Caesar is centering in on a, a problem with representative democracy that is distinct mm -hmm. and novel from uh, and, and requires a different approach than the, than the sort of direct democracy uh, suggestions that mm -hmm. have been made uh, over time. Well, this feels a bit Tom Cruise and Minority Report-ish, but um, okay, you said scrutiny's coming. Yes, it is. Gary, have at it. What do you think? Well, not surprisingly, I kind of hate the idea, <laughs> um, partially because, uh, you know, this is why we elect people. We elect people for this very reason, to make tough decisions. 
uh, to to think through the impacts that these these decisions that they're making have on broader society. And, uh, you know, if if we're moving to a machine learning system of governance, then we might as well just all pack it up and go home and, and forget about, uh, you know, engagement on a on a regular basis. I mean, this is what why people run for politics and why run people run for elected office. They want to make a change. They want to make a difference. And they are empowered to read legislation and consider a amendments and sit on committees and think about these big issues of the day and advocate for these positions uh, personally uh, within within party caucuses or as independents in the House of Commons. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think once we start going down this path, I think it's a very dangerous path uh, that uh, leads us into all sorts of uh, difficult places. And uh, I, for one, certainly don't want to go down that road. Pass, you were the one about uh, 20, 25 minutes ago who introduced this idea in our discussion of uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, doable and or desirable? What's your thought? Doable? Probably not desirable. I mean, we started talking about how people don't trust politicians. You know what else they don't trust? AI. Let's not put <laughs> the two together just yet. But I think Caesar is helping us think through. He's just kind of at a, at a more polar end of the spectrum. How do we share power? That's what we're talking about. Do we share power correctly? And, you know, I am of the mind we do not elect thought leaders. We elect thought followers. And it's a very kind of Spice Girl model of policymaking. No disrespect to the Spice Girls. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. We can use AI and technology to experiment to better reflect what we want and need. And politicians can continue to do their job, but do it better to say, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And why aren't we doing other kind of decisions or, or pathways that we might want to take, which goes to the explainability point. I wonder, though, Vass, whether or not the public, I shouldn't say the public, whether huge chunks of the public are so disenchanted mm -hmm. with our institutions as they are right now that they just might want to take a flyer on something completely different, as in AI or machine learning. What do you think? I think the appetite for experimentation and for our institutions to show that they're trying new things, that they're experimenting, that they're looking you know, looking into new technologies to supplement and complement and enhance their work would be really invigorating and help people feel kind of that the work on behalf of them is trying to be more robust than it currently is. Because I think we do have a pretty good consensus here that, you know, people just don't feel it's sufficiently rep it represents them and, and Canada as a whole. Well, let me follow up with Cliff on that, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, if I look in the province of Ontario, Cliff, since the end of World War II, we have had the same political parties in this province exactly. We've had Liberals, Tories, and New Democrats since the end of World War II, and one Green. In the last election, we got one Green, and that was the biggest change. Whereas if you look next door in Quebec, or if you look in Saskatchewan or British Columbia, you've got new parties coming and going all the time. We have a very traditional, established way of doing politics in the province of Ontario. Now, I don't know if that reflects contentment or if it reflects a sclerotic nature of our political system that just is not open to changes. In which case, pick up on that if you would. What, what do you think that portends mm -hmm. for us? Cliff, that's for you. So I suggest that it's a reflection of the dynamics of power and the structures of power in the province of Ontario more than anything else. Um, I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Bass's point that I think there's an appetite for, for change. Uh, how that change manifests, the form it takes, is uh, I, unclear to, uh, I think, to most of us and, and to most members mm -hmm. of the public. Um, but I do think introducing these interesting ideas about alternate forms of governance at least opens up a public discussion, a conversation around what the current problems really are with yeah. uh, democratic representation in Canada and in Ontario. Um, and perhaps the solutions are far-fetched, but I think that's the point of these thought experiments, to get us thinking about what the future may hold. Um, representative, representative democracy is a very old concept. It, uh, you know, it goes back to the Roman republics, so it's not this notion that it's going to change overnight, but that we can introduce new ideas and, and nuanced ways of thinking about it um, in order to try and uh, address some of the deficits that we've identified and have been trying to um, uh, improve upon for decades. Gary, how open do you think the Canadian public are? Or, or for that matter, how open do you think official Ottawa is to mm -hmm. um, entertaining some of these uh, new and different ideas? 
Well, just just to go back a little bit to the last point, which I think was really important about Ontario, is I think it's not just a Canadian political culture. There are regional political cultures that do accept a little bit more, um, you know, loose fish randomness uh, in, uh, in in the political culture. I think of BC, I think of Alberta, where even at the federal level, BC has been more likely to elect independent MPs to the House of Commons uh, than Ontario has. Uh, look, mm. official Ottawa uh, and the party system is, you know, highly resistant to change, and these things take a lot of time. But Part of the reason is, and I wanted to touch on this, as you know, people talk about, well, MPs should be more independent and speak out. And I think if you, even against their own parties, and I think if you talk mm. to people, MPs who have done that, they realize it's not a panacea. They speak out and they say, well, I actually, you know, feel very different than my party on this issue. I'm actually opposed to my party on this issue. And what's the reward for it? Oh, there's a media story about but how there's division in the ranks and this person is off in left field and, and partisans from the other side say, ah, there's a split. The leadership is weak, right? So we can talk about you know, a lot of independent thought. But the reality is, is that official Ottawa and the, and the structures that are in place are very resistant to change. Hmm. Vass, you but want the last Gary, 30 seconds on this? I mean, sure. Like, what if those independents had the data behind them to say, listen, I'm this conduit for my riding. This is the information I had. I have. This is the deliberative work I've done. And now doing my best job to represent them and layering in, you know, my own thoughts this is kind of the data-driven approach to dissent that I'm taking. I think that's what we want. We don't want politicians to be swinging around kind of independently, not on behalf of anyone but themselves, making policy and making decisions. That's not the point. That'll have to be the last word today. And unless, Vass, you really, really, really want to zig a zig ah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the first Spice Girls reference we've had on this program in 15 years, so we thank you for that. That's uh, Vass Bednar, the public policy consultant and editor-in-chief of Regs to Riches, Clifton Vanderlinden, assistant professor of political science, McMaster University, Gary Keller, Strategy Corp., and the former chief of staff to Canada's one-time foreign minister, John Baird. It's great to have the three of you on TVO tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. 10, 20, 20, 20. Author Barbara A. Meals' tell-all memoir offers a rare look inside the high society world she and Conrad Black occupy. She is with us tomorrow for a future interview. Also, we'll assess how COVID-19 has changed how and what we eat. Hope you'll be with us for that. I'm Steve Paik, and thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.